Uh, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Whittle. You're most probably aware that I work for Dayaxi, and this is the six in our sort of Meet the Experts series. And for those of you who have been on and listened to these webinars before, the, the purpose of these webinars is to try and compare and contrast various things that businesses coming from the UK to the US encounter, which are substantially different than the UK, so that hopefully by doing a bit of a compare and contrast, there is an ability to sort of uh, hopefully understand how the various things in the US work. Today's presentation is sort of looking at the ins and outs of US payroll requirements and sort of a bit of a 101 yeah. in how US payroll works and some of the things you need to be aware of uh, just when you are setting up in the US or taking on employees. Uh, it gives me, as per normal, we always have somebody here uh, with us to chat through and we try and have these webinars more in a bit of a dialogue situation to try and hopefully make it easier and more informative to listen to. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Keith McLeod from Heartland Payroll. I believe some of you may already know Keith, uh, but Keith has been in the payroll industry for seven years and he really is at his position as sort of a senior relationship manager and sort of troubleshooter with his clients with issues that come up. Uh, because I always say that I think in the US, of all the different taxes as a comparison to the UK, payroll is mostly one of the most complex, one of the easiest to get wrong. So uh, I always say when we're, we're helping somebody, you need to get an expert or an expert payroll company uh, to help you out with that. So without further ado, we are going to go through the 101 of payroll in the US this morning. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Keith McLeod and uh, morning in the US, Keith, and uh, thank you for coming in to talk today. So uh, if you'd like to take it away, we'll, we'll start talking about what's going on. One quick thing I keep always forget to think is there is the ability to type in questions. Uh, so please type in your questions as we go along. We will try and answer as many as we can during the presentation today, but what we can't answer, we will get back to you afterwards uh, so that everybody's questions will be answered. So uh, Keith, welcome and thanks very much for coming in this morning. Thanks for having me, Rob. We're going to get to the first slide. Okay. The first thing that you need to consider when you're starting a business in the United States and going to bring on um, people to help you run your business is whether or not uh, um, what is considered to be employees, what payroll taxes need to do with that, and what are the employer's responsibility as far as bringing on employees. Okay, so it's important here, especially in, in the U.S., to uh, determine whether or not people are considered employees as opposed to um, contractors. There's a, a set of specific, <clears throat> not specific, a non-specific guidelines that can kind of help you through that as far as determining whether or not you are, the people that are assisting you in your business should be considered employees or contractors. Um, an employee in our, in the most basic terms is any person that's hired to perform services for the company who receives an hourly wage, salary, bonus, or commission. As far as the employee goes, you, um, somebody that you set up your hours for, that you can bring, that you bring into the office, that they are using your tools and equipment, um, you're training them on company policies, things like that, those are all people that should be classified as an employee. They would also be required to fill out specific employee documentation for new hires. Um, the I-9 is a very important document that you would have to have for them, which determines whether or not they're legal to work in the United States. Um, but W-4 is also something that would set up to help them determine what their tax withholdings are going to be. Keith, just at the moment, given where we are, the political environment we've got over here at the moment, which uh, is being reported around the world, that... Uh, <clears throat> immigration is a big issue at the moment and closing the borders. I'm, I'm assuming at the moment for anybody listening to make sure, make, making sure they've got their I-9 documentation in place is most really paramount. And what are the, what are the what are you seeing in the in the field with sort of the I-9s and authority agencies and how are they looking at them? Yeah, it's definitely a, a point of emphasis right now to make sure that everybody that you have working for your company is either a U.S. citizen or somebody that has applied to work legally in the United States. Um, an I-9 document is something that you're supposed to keep on file for all employees. Uh, if you were to get audited and not have one on file, we've seen the penalties go from $400 to $3,200 per employee for not having 
an I-9 document on file. And, and obviously, as I think, as was sent out uh, to everybody, I believe everybody's got a copy of the I-9 form. It's actually not a tax form. It's actually an immigration form, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Yes, it has, it has more to do with, with legal employment in the, in the U.S. as opposed to any tax withholdings, anything like that. And, and once again, my understanding with this form is as long as you do what it would be deemed to be uh, due care and attention to it, so that in effect is if a passport looked like it was a fraudulent passport, you didn't accept it, that you did everything that any reasonable person could do and you keep the documentation on file for, for sort of a, while they're still an employee forever sort of thing, is that, that should be that should be enough to satisfy the, the things. You're not supposed to go out and start vetting passports and <laughs> that sort of thing. It's just you've got to do your reasonable due diligence, haven't you, with these, these forms? Correct. Yeah. M most liability falls on an employer in the United States as opposed to an employee. So the more that you have documentation of and the more that you keep on file, the better off you're going to be. <clears throat> So the other thing you're talking about, so what, what, what are the sort of things that, because obviously it's a bit like in the UK when we talked about it, is this area between an employee and, and a contractor can be very grey at times. What sort of things would you be looking at to distinguish and say that the person you're hiring or you're paying is a contractor as opposed to an employee? The contractor would be somebody that you have set up a formal agreement on. You should have it in writing. It should be for a specific length of term or for a specific job where you're, they're bringing in, they're setting in their, setting up their own schedule. They can hire assistants under themselves. They're supposed to have their own really corporation type uh, of a business set up for themselves individually. Um, you cannot hire and fire them unless it's based on breaks the terms of the agreement that you sign with them. So a lot of people want to have everybody a subcontractor because then it eliminates the business from having to pay taxes on it. But in most cases, um, when you've got someone working for you, it's an employee as opposed to a contractor. Um, so I think in a lot of these situations where uh, <clears throat> very often when we've got clients that are coming from the UK to the US, uh, that they may be having to take on something to help them over here. Obviously, I, I think from a UK perspective, in the UK, there's still this very gray area between an employee and the employ and their self-employed person. But in the UK, when you take on employees, then you have to have any contract in the UK, so it's a bigger bind. Whereas, as we've talked about in previous webinars, in the US, it's employment at will. But, but I think also when people come over here, it's also a lot easier if, if you're not 100% sure the person's going to work for you. Very often, people might practically want to set them up and put them on, uh, put them on as a self-employed for a short period of time to see if it works out with the intention of maybe converting to an employee. It, it seems like one of the big things to make sure we've got in place there is most probably the written contract, correct? Correct. What other, we've talked about here with the I-9 documentation and the W-4 when you come as an employee, what sort of documentation if we take on, an, uh, on a subcontractor should we get from the subcontractor to make sure uh, everything's in place? The two important things to have for that would be a written signed contract and getting a W-9 form from them, which for the business aspect of it. And, and the W-9 form is obviously them stating to uh, to us as the employer that they are self-employed. It also tells us what type of entity they are, whether they're individual sub uh, S corporation or a partnership. So at the end of the year, we can uh, we can determine whether we need to issue them a 1099 to be in compliance with the 1099 subcontractor reporting requirements. The, the thing that we have seen, Keith, which uh, as a practical issue is very often, as you've most recently seen it as well, when you've talked to your clients, is very often people don't want to give a W-9 uh, a w because the fact is now it's in the IRS system. But I think the thing that when you have trouble like that, what we've seen as a practical solution to that is that if subcontractors won't give a W-9 to you to show that they're subcontractors, is basically you as the employee, as the payor, as the company paying them, are supposed to do a 20%, 8% backup withholding. And that's normally a very good incentive that they then to give you their employer identification number or their social security number so they can get paid in full. Sure, that, yeah, that is correct. And it's also one of those situations where if you are um, hiring people on and you're paying them as subcontractors, the liability is really falling on you as the business. So if somebody gets hurt or if, they, if you don't issue the 1099 properly, if they don't pay the taxes, they try to file for unemployment. A lot of that stuff falls back on the business owner as opposed to the employee, the people they... And, and what you mean by that is, in effect, the agency that gets involved, first of all, comes to the employer because the employer is easier to find than the employee. 
sure that's why it's so important. We're trying to stress it with all these forms, get them in place to protect you as the employer as much as possible. Correct. So once you've determined whether or not um, you're taking on a contractor or an employee, um, the employee when you when you take on people as employees for the business, there's several taxes that you are re required to withhold and make payments for. Um, the federal, uh, I'm sorry, the FICA taxes is Social Security and Medicare. Uh, you have federal income tax, state income tax. Federal unemployment tax, state unemployment tax, workers' compensation, and local taxes, depending on where you one are operating and one where your employees are working. Some of these vary a little bit, but they're they're several of them are standard for all across the board. Some of the taxes are required for um, employees to be withheld, and some of them are for the employer only contributions. The, uh, the FICA tax is something that both sides pay, so the Social Security and Medicare, there's a match from the employer and the employee, so as the employer you will hold it from the employee's check and you'll also match, match it when you go to make the payments. As far as the employer liability is concerned, you're also required to, to withhold, I'm sorry, not withhold, with, to pay federal unemployment, state unemployment, and workers' compensation. The employee side of it, though, they're required to do the, the FICA, the federal income tax, state income tax, and local income tax is if, if they uh, do apply. We're going to break these down individually. So just we're, we're going to go through these in, each, in detail of what they apply, how they apply and what, what the implications of them. But just for everybody li listening, if you're not aware, if you do a comp comparison to the UK, is from an employer perspective, the FICA is the equivalent of employer's national insurance in the UK. There really is in the UK no equivalent to the sort of federal unemployment or state unemployment. The workers' compensation would maybe be the equivalent of sort of employ, uh, employee liability and insurance to cover your employees when they're at work. Uh, from the employee perspective, the FICA is the same as employees, national insurance. Federal ta income tax would be the equivalent of PAYE in the UK, and then obviously in the UK we don't have a state income tax or a local income tax, just the PAYE. But for those listening, that's sort of if you were trying to compare and contrast between the two, that's the that's what we have to the equivalent in the UK with what's on the screen there. Okay, so we're going to start off with the the FICA tax. It's, it's called the, the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. Um, it's got two parts to it. Social Security, which is a 6.2% withheld on the first $127,200 that are earned by the employee. Uh, then the Medicare is 1.45% withheld on all earned wages. So if you, if you make $5 million, you're getting the 1.45 withheld on all earned wages. As the employer, you're required to withhold that from the employee, make the payments, and you're also required to match them up to the, the wage base limit for Social Security and the Medicare. Do, the, do these, uh, so this 127,200, does this, is this something that changes on, does this go up on an annual basis or how does that? Work? Actually, the, the last couple of years it has been going up, but uh, typically it's not something that changes all that much, but recently it's been, it's been uh, increasingly going up. Okay, what, um, so it's interesting here, once again as a comparison to UK, is from, from the UK perspective, the employee piece of employee national insurance, which would be equivalent to FICA, is that, that sort of gets, you, you pay sort of 12% up to a certain level, then you go down to two, which is a bit like the Social Security Medicare brackets where you pay so much to start with and then it gets reduced. But from an employer perspective, Unlike in the U.S., the employer national insurance at 13.8 applies to whatever level your wages. So it's a little bit, it's sort of similar but different than the U.K. how the FICA system works. And obviously the U.K. rates are, the percentages are higher. What about, there's a most very practical situation sometimes is, what about if during the year we have a, there's a company in the U.K. that sets up in the U.S. and it's halfway through the year and they take on an employee in the U.S. who's just, a, hasn't been transferred from the U.K., so it's been working in the U.S., and they've worked for somebody earlier in the year. How do, how, is there any continuation of how the sort of the federal withholding works or how the FICA works? How, how does that work when you change employees, employers? Uh, they really just basically started over again. If you end up getting past that 127,000, 
that you can apply for a refund on the on your personal income tax return at the end of the year to get the get the money back that you paid over that wage baseline. So just to give an example there, Keith, if I understand you correctly, what you what you're saying is that if for the first six months I get paid a hundred thousand, that employer will take out from a social security perspective six point two percent. So I'll have about six thousand two hundred taken out for my first six months. I now come and work for your company and you put me on the FICA again and you start me off at zero again in effect and I now pay 6.2 on that 100,000 that I've earned from you. So in effect, I've now paid 6.2 on 200,000, but, but it caps out at 127. So is there any way I can get that 6.2 excess back on the excess sort of uh, 70,000 of wages I've, I've been subject to 6.2? Yeah, that is actually something that you can apply for, for a refund on your personal tax return at the end of the year. Okay, so ultimately, if you have one, two, three employers, and in a sense, if you add all your wages together, and you get more taken out during the year, in effect, it gets refunded at the end of the year when you file your personal tax return. Correct. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so that, I think that, that, that's good there. Then, in effect, is we're going to talk about federal income tax. Okay, federal income tax is an employee contribution that has to be held by withheld by the employer. Uh, the tax rate is determined based on the amount of income expected to earn in the calendar year. The information provided on the completion of the W-4 form, which you'll need to have given out to every employee to fill out, um, that, that's going to determine what the tax percentage is that, that you need to withhold from the employee and make the payment um, to the government for it. Now, when you have this PA, when you have the equivalent of UK PAY, US withhold, federal withholding tax, if you're just an employee uh, and you and you fill out your W four, do you do you ever have to do you have to file a tax return, or does that calculate your tax exactly? No, it doesn't actually do it. It's very rare that it's done exact um, here in the United States. So when you do a tax return at the end of the year, you're either going to determine whether you pay too much or too little, and there's a true up at the end of the year. Typically, it's People like to get more taxes withheld to get a return at the end of the year, but there are situations where people have to end up paying taxes at the end of the year. Yeah, which is a little bit different, if, once again, from a UK perspective, where very often if you can get the PAYE coding correct, uh, which is the equivalent of the W-4, then in effect it takes care of everything you don't need to file a return at the end of the year. Uh, here's an example of what a W-4 looks like. It's important to have every employee fill one of these out and also you want to keep that on file along with your I-9 in your employee file. Now the, the <clears throat> with respect to this I know we have situations that come up that I wanted to bring to people's attention of sort of things that we see that sort of go wrong with the W-4 sometimes is the, the first is if you go down to the sort of onto the W-4 itself you'll see that towards the bottom there under number three if you can see it on your screen you check a box of whether you're single, married, or married, but withhold at higher single rates. Those boxes there determine at what rate, in effect, your PAYE, your federal withholding, is taken out at based on tables. What we have seen happen quite often is we have seen where maybe we've had clients where they send employees over to the U.S. They come over as a married couple and they've both got visas. One works for the company when they're coming over from one works for somebody else. They fill out the W-4 and they both check married, which is correct and very often the HR department there doesn't bring it to their attention and ask them the question is is your spouse working as well in the US because what happens is when you check that married box it's deemed as if your other partner is not working so you get a, a larger amount at a larger amount you can earn and pay less taxes because you're getting to use your spouse's rates as well and very often we'll come to the end of the year and we'll be doing the tax return for the person who's over here and they get a big shock they owe five six grand and it's because the w4 has been filled out correctly so i want to bring this up to everybody on on the call because when you do send people over here and if both spouses are working just try and make sure that they check the right box on the w4 which should be the married but withhold at higher single rate because ultimately if something goes wrong and they're an employee of yours you're sending over here i'm pretty sure they're going to come back to you and be a little upset and even though it's not your fault it's still just a way to maybe uh, stop the, the horse bolting and make sure you don't have to lose any employee goodwill when they come over here. So just that's just something we've seen in practice where things happen, uh, where the forms fill out 
what they believe is correct, but they get a shock at the end of the year because they've just checked the wrong married box. Yeah, that's true. And when you're looking at it from a W-4 perspective for the employees, a good general rule is if you want to have more taxes withheld, the lower number that you're going to put for your uh, dependents. So if you want all as much tax as you can get taken out, you want to file single zero. It'll take the maximum amount out. You're less likely to have to pay it up uh, to, in the reconciliation period, you're less likely to owe money if you the lower number that you put on there. And just to clarify, when Keith talks about dependents, unlike in the UK when you file your return, if you've got uh, children, kids, in effect, you get to take an allowance for them on your return, and that's what we mean by dependents. So for everybody you claim an allowance on your personal return, you can claim a dependency, and, and also, in effect, you can claim an exemption for yourself, which would be the equivalent of like a personal allowance. Uh, so you just have to say, as Keith said, the lower those numbers, the more the light, more likelihood is you'll get a refund. And it, it's weird because sometimes people do like refunds and they'll put zeros in there just so they get a refund in January, February when they file their return. <laughs> yeah, which is not uncommon. It's also one of those things, this is not something that gets filled out once and is set in stone. You can adjust it throughout the year if you feel that you necessary, if you need to, if you're going to maybe take a new position or, an, or you're become a highly compensated employee, something like that. It's something that you can always adjust. Okay. Uh, throughout the year. Does this, does this form just stay with the employer or does it go to the IRS? It's going to say, to the, to the, I was going to say, I, to the best of my knowledge, this only ever stays with the uh, with the employer. Yeah, you, this is something that you would just put in the employee file and they, they, they can be refilled out at any point. Some of the information shouldn't change, but if someone gets married, somebody has a kid, something like that, it's one of those things that you want to get a new one on file for that employee if something in their life changes. And the other thing is the employer in general isn't going to come to you to ask if you want to change. It's not, this is normally, the change in these is normally driven by the employee asking to have a new W-4. Correct. But, but once again, it's just from a communication perspective is when in the, in the UK very often your uh, change in your exemptions is changed automatically by uh, the, the government. If people came here, I think everybody listening here, you most when when you get your employees to fill out these W fours if they're coming from the UK, is to most probably say if, if they want to change it, it's going to be it's going to be them themselves who decide that to change it as opposed to the government coming from. Correct. There's not really an there's there's no real wrong way to fill out a W four, but there's a way to make them more accurate. I guess. Yes. Just as we go through, so far it doesn't appear anybody's got any questions, so either, Keith, you're doing a fantastic job or people haven't found how to ask the questions. But please remember, if you do have questions, uh, type them in so we can uh, try and have a little bit of an interactive conversation while we've been through the slides. Okay, so the next one that we're on to is a state income tax. Almost all of the states in the United States have a state income tax. There's a couple that uh, that don't. So if you have some, if you have employees in like say Florida, Texas, Nevada are some of the more common ones that don't have a state withholding. This is something that you will be required to withhold from the employee. It's an employee only tax based on the, the state that they live in and um, where the work is being performed. So this is something that you would withhold and also make payments to out of their paycheck and make payments to the state for it. And once again, as you would like with the federal, you, most states have a state W-4 where you then claim your exemptions to determine how much you want to take out. Correct. It usually ends up mirroring your your federal W-4, so it's not a not a huge huge difference typically. So that's most of the time if we don't if you don't have one from an employee, that a good default to use is what they fill out on the W-4. Okay, the FUTA tax, Federal Unemployment Tax Act. This is an employer-only tax of 0.6%. It's assessed on the first $7,000 of an employee's earned wages. Um, it becomes the 0.6% the based on the fact that it's actually a 6% tax, but most states have a state unemployment tax, so they give you a credit, and the credit is worth up to 5.4% which knocks the number down to the 0.6% for the federal income tax. This is an employer only, so you're required to withhold it. And I'm sorry, there's no withholding required. You pay this in addition to what you're paying the employee, 0.6% on the first $7,000 of what they earn for the year. 
and then that is that is capped out at seven thousand, isn't it? So Correct. First seven thousand. <clears throat> and I think the other thing just to note here is it's my understanding because I've had this one situation come up that we'll talk about state unemployment tax, but if there is a situation where you don't have to pay any state unemployment tax or you elect out of it, certain in certain states you can potentially do that, depending on how your business is set up, then in effect is you don't get the credit and you go back to the six percent. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, state unemployment tax is the is the next one. Um, this is an employer only tax. Again, it's determined by the individual state. Wage base limits range between seven thousand, like the federal, up to as much as thirty thousand, depending on the state. Uh, individual applications by the state are completed to determine the liability. So, basically, you go on to whatever government website that they have and you will fill out an application they will ask you questions about the business about compensation of employees about number of employees things like that they will assign you an account number they will assign you a rate and then you will be required to pay that based on what you pay the employees and, and that really, my understanding is that there's like the standard rate when you start in the state but depending does that rate always stay the same or does it go up or down or the the state usually, typically every state assigns you a new business rate. So if you're a brand new business and you're coming over from the UK or just starting a business here, you'll get a, a jump start rate. The state unemployment fund works like a giant pool of money. So you, you put in a bunch, however much money you put in, you're constantly contributing to it. The more that you take out, the more that they make you put back in. So if you've got people that have filed for unemployment and they're actually using the unemployment fund, your rate could tends to go up. If you don't have anybody that you've had to put on unemployment, the rate will tend to go down. It's the only adjustable tax rate that you really have any control over as a business owner for what you're paying. Okay. Now, we, we talked a little bit earlier, you and I offline, is maybe you can explain to every listening in a sense is, if, if, because I know you're in here in Ohio, so how would the sort of process work how would an employer know if somebody's making a claim or something like that? Or how does it how does it work for Ohio? The employee has to go and file a claim uh, to to file for unemployment. The business gets notification. You have to in Ohio everything is in typical typically in the in the states in general. All the liability falls on the employer. So once they put in the claim, they'll send the information to the business. There's a, usually a set amount of days that you have to respond to the claim. It's in Ohio, it's within 20 days of receiving it. If you don't respond to the claim, they automatically will get enrolled in, file, in, in, in unemployment. So if it's somebody that you've, if you determined that was, was not keeping up with their job description or was showing up later, you caught stealing from the company and you had to terminate them, one, you have to make sure you have great documentation of all kinds of written warnings and um, verbal warnings and things like that. You want to keep that on file along with the other stuff that you keep with the employees and make sure that if if they are not so basically with your state on where your state unemployment is if, if the the purpose of it sort of working is if the business is having to contract and I suppose the equipment it would be in the UK is in the UK if people have worked for you for a certain period of time you're required most probably to pay them redundancy or something like that if the business is contracting and you've got to lay them off this is sort of here is if you're busy, if you're having to contract and you have to lay them off, they're a good worker, but you just can't take them on because the business is shrinking, they have the ability then to claim unstable employment. But Correct. if they have, like you said, stolen from the company or that, then in effect they can make a claim, but then it's the employer when they receive that claim to say, no, don't pay this because this is the reason we let them go. Correct. Uh, but if you don't do anything, then they will get enrolled. And the downside to that as an employer is your rate potentially will go up because they're claiming on your, in a sense, sub-fund. Correct. And when the rate goes up, it goes up for every employee. So it's not like it just goes up for one, one person or something like that. And typically, they don't readjust rates for a year or two. So once it starts going up, you're going to be paying that on up to 7000 to up to 30000 depending on where what state you're located in. So it's very much like an insurance policy in effect, is when you came on an insurance policy, it's many years before that premium goes back down. Yeah, there are a lot, it goes. It likes to go up a lot quicker than it comes back down. Yeah. 
in Ohio, it's you're basically as the employer, you have to prove that the employee was fi was fired justly, or if someone's a false claim didn't work for your company, the employee doesn't really have to prove a whole lot. The defaults always go towards the employee's favor, not the employer. So it's important to make sure that you respond in a time timely fashion to any unemployment claims. Now, now there was an interesting thing here we were talking about, which we we're going to talk about a bit later, but it might be a good thing to bring it in here, is <clears throat> we were talking about earlier about whether you're an employee or a subcontractor. There's lots of times where you might, for ease of sake, say actually one of them is a subcontractor, but maybe you can explain one of the things you may be seeing where somebody who's a subcontractor can actually come and cause you a problem at a later date. Yeah, in Ohio, one of the more frequently audited things is, is, is Ohio unemployment because the, the, the unemployment rate is so high here. So if you've misclassified someone as a subcontractor, but they're functioning as a, sub, as a contractor and you're paying them a salary and then you end up firing them and they go to claim unemployment on you, that's always, that when a red flag will get uh, thrown up because you haven't paid into the unemployment tax because they are a contractor. And, and what I think we're talking about here, where there's the risk here or could really cause a problem is if we haven't got the right documentation in at the start, then if we haven't got the right documentation at the start, then in effect is it can come back to bite us this way because what could happen is they could come in, he makes a claim, we get audited now because he's making a claim, they come in and say that he should have been an employee and then that can open up a whole can of worms. Whereas if we got all the paperwork in place as, as best we could as a contractor, if he made that claim, then it was easy. It would be a lot easier to re rebut it and say, no, in actual fact, you are a contractor. Correct. And where the where the issue comes is, again, like everything else, typically the liability falls on the employer. So whatever taxes and things have not been paid and penalties falls on the employer, not the employee that was misclassified. Okay, workers' compensation. This is another one that is typically determined, it's, well, it's, it's always determined individually by the states, the individual state that you're working in. It provides coverage for people who are injured on the job. It's either handled by the state or by outside insurance companies like uh, your car insurance would be handled. Rates are, are usually determined by how dangerous your job is, what kind of uh, things that you do, um, your performance in those jobs and also if your company has a history of claims. And, and we were talking here is, uh, I, I know you were talking in Ohio that if you're a subcontractor, you're supposed to carry your own workers' compensation. But my understanding is, and, and, and I'm not an expert in this, but my understanding is you just have to be careful in other states because sometimes I believe that for workers' compensation purposes, the definition of a subcontractor, an employee, is different than it might be for federal withholding tax purposes and where I think you can sometimes be caught is you could have maybe somebody who's a subcontractor for federal withholding tax purposes, but for workers' compensation purposes, because of what they're performing for you, they're actually deemed to be an employee and need to be covered under your policy. So I, I've seen that a long time ago, but I just want to bring that to everybody's attention is just be aware when you're talking about workers' compensation and you're talking through it, you just, in a sense, most probably explain to, every, explain to the insurance provider uh, exactly who you got working for you and any of those people who potentially are in that gray area where they are a contractor but somebody might argue they're an employee because they're working for you so much sort of thing. Correct, yeah, and that's one of the things that you, you definitely want to ask questions on because they, they, it does vary between individual states and I know uh, several, several companies out there also have employees working in different states under the same company. All of these things apply for the different states that they're working in. It's not under where the business is actually located. Okay, local income tax. This is something that doesn't apply everywhere, but it's something we wanted to bring to your attention just in case you do live in one of the places um, like we do. Ohio is a big one for local taxes. Any city in Ohio, you are required to withhold uh, local taxes for and make the payments. Some of the other big ones are uh, the cities in some of the some of the bordering states of Ohio. So New York, New York City has some of the taxes. Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania does. Philadelphia in Pennsylvania does. So it's one of those things that you'll also need to determine when you're going through the process of setting up the payroll if you need to apply one apply for uh, 
any IDs that you would need to make a payment to for local taxes and or if it applies for where you're working. With, I think the one thing you just mentioned there, applying for IDs, I think the one point that's important to bring up, which I think we haven't mentioned yet is, and it's a real pain, is the fact that with all these different taxes we're talking about, it's quite often, except at the federal level, we mostly have to apply for new registration numbers. Correct. And that's that's usually when, when you apply for on the, on the websites for, because everything's online now, for these registrations is usually when they determine what rates that you need to pay for that individual area, whether it's a state or a city, or in some cases we've even seen a county tax. So it's important to do your due diligence in the beginning of the process. Getting it set up right is very important so you have everything ready to go when you have to start paying your individual employees. Okay, um, something that's a little bit different here is compared to in the UK is the frequency that we pay employees. Um, certain companies will pay monthly, some will pay bi-weekly, some will pay semi-monthly, which is twice a month, usually the 15th and the 30th, or a monthly payroll. There's a, a lot of these are preference depending on the employee or the company. But, but I think over here it's, it's, it's a slightly culturally different. In the UK, unless you are maybe uh, getting paid on an hourly basis, if you're on a salary, it's almost always in the UK monthly, where in the US I would say monthly is more of a rarity and it's mostly more twice a month or every two weeks, so you get 26 pay packets in the year. Correct. Yes, typically it's either the 24 or the 26 pay periods in a year. Depending on industry, um, some uh, industries, a lot of, when, when you have a little bit more turnover, seasonal work, things like that is when they typically go into that weekly format. And a lot of union companies require that you pay that, so it doesn't always apply. What about, so we're talking about payroll frequency here, and we've talked about so far all the different taxes that are employee withholding taxes or employer payroll taxes. Uh, obviously, we're collecting the money from the employees, and we how, how often do we have to make those payments over to the various taxing authorities? Um, typically, it works for usually the, mo the, the, more, the most frequent is a monthly deposit. Most things are, are quarter or monthly or quarterly. In Ohio, there is one strange one with workers' comp where you make payments every other month. That's not a, a typical situation. I would say most of them are due 15 days after the month that the payroll is running or quarterly. And then the associated returns that are with those payments are usually done on a quarterly or an annual basis. So even if you're required to maybe make your deposit the 15th day after the end of the month because you're at a monthly level, that return that, re that reports that is mostly still on a quarterly basis. Correct. And we've even seen if you, if you are without employees for a certain, like the first quarter of a year and you had a payroll in the previous year, most agencies want you to file a zero return as well. So even if you didn't have any payroll in that quarter, they still want a return that says that you did not have any payroll in that quarter. So basically, in effect, is what you're saying there is you, you, you're set up in the U.S., you take on an employee, unfortunately it doesn't work out, you spend three or four months trying to find somebody, during that period of time you go through another cycle, just make sure you keep up with all your filings, otherwise you're going to get notices and, and, and questions why you're not filing. Correct keeps you out of default situations as well. So other payroll withholdings that we talk about, this is when you determine when you bring on an employee what they're going to put into their job description as far as how holiday pay works, vacation or paid time off, sick pay, insurance if you're going to offer them health insurance, uh, retirement plans or Section 125 cafeteria insurance plans as well. And what we mean here, I think the one, the couple here I would uh, sort of just focus on is the insurance. So when we're talking about insurance here, we're talking about health insurance. In, in the U.S., as I think people who've been on presentations before will know that sometimes the employer pays the health insurance, sometimes the employee pays it. If the employee pays it, then it's normally a pre-tax deduction if it's set up through a Section 125 cafeteria plan. And then it gets deducted off your payroll at source. So, in effect, it's all taken care of from a compliance perspective there. The same with retirement plans. Retirement plans in the U.S. almost all work where the company plans as if it's the equivalent of a salary sacrifice in the U.K. So, in effect, it's taken off your gross pay, and then you are taxed at the withholding level 
from a as a PAYE on the net amount. Whereas in the UK, you can do salary sacrifice, or you can still pay into your pension net and then get it grossed up for the taxes that uh, for the tax relief that you get once it goes into the pension. The other thing I, I suppose that I wanted to bring to everybody's attention was a little bit of difference between benefits in kind in the UK and how they're sort of reported compared to the US. So in, in the UK, whenever you get any benefits from working, whether it's health insurance or a car or something like that, then in effect you end up having to report it on a P11D. In, in the US, the reporting requirements are different. So if in the US you have an employee who goes out and has some business expenses and as long as they give you the receipts and you pay them back under an accountable plan, basically meaning that they've given you the receipt, it becomes a deduction to the company and there's no reporting that you have to do to the individual. However, if you just decide maybe you've got, uh, you're in a business where you've just got sales personnel in the US and you just decide you want to give them $600 a month, in effect, is an, a big, that's a non-accountable plan because you're just giving them $600 that you don't require them to document or substantiate what they're doing. That becomes taxable wages to them and you just add it to the uh, your wages on a monthly or uh, bi-weekly basis whenever you pay. What we mean by de minimis fringe benefits is where you have occasional parties or picnics for the staff. You maybe give them occasion, a ticket to go to a sporting event or something like that. Uh, tea, coffee in the office as refreshments. If there's coming up to holiday periods, you give them a small holiday gift. Those would fall under what we call de minimis fringe benefits and wouldn't have to be reported to them. So I suppose the question is, is what does need to get reported to an employee and how does it get reported? Uh, the, the, the main things we see that we would see things most for you, a car benefit. So if you, obviously a company has a company car, you go through a calculation as to what the benefit is to the employee and then it gets reported on the wage and gets reported on the year end W2 and is included in their gross wages, which would be the equivalent of the P60 in the UK. So in the US, the P11D and the P60 are combined into one document called the W2 at the end of the year. So it's just a, it's just a difference. And then you've got things, you've got differences like I think we've talked about before. Health insurance in the UK is a, is a benefit in kind. Health insurance in the US isn't a benefit in kind. So you just need to be aware of maybe the differences of how things are taxed and reported with respect to benefits in kind to employees. Okay, we wanted to touch on a little bit on what the possible penalties and, and fines could be for failure of payment. Uh, it's, it's really important that you figure out not only what liabilities you determine depending on what state you're in and the, the cities or counties that you live in because mistakes can be penalized and they can be penalized pretty heavily. The IRS says that about 40% of small businesses in the United States that do their own payroll um, get assessed a tax penalty per year. And the average penalty is about $850 per year. So it's one of those things that it's everybody thinks it may be something that's simple to do, but there's a lot of deadlines. There's a lot of different determinations depending on where you work and what you're doing as far as uh, the job goes. So it's very important to pay attention to, to those things when you're setting up your payroll for the first time. With respect to uh, if you do get a penalty, uh, do, and do you see that the taxing authorities or the IRS will waive them or basically is once you've got a penalty, whatever you do, it is what it is? Because I know with corporate tax and stuff like that, sometimes you can be systems where if it's a reasonable cause that something happened, they will waive penalties. Are you, do you see the IRS doing that much with uh, payroll penalties? They're very unforgiving with payroll penalties because of the situation where most of the time it's the employer is withholding money from an employee that need they want to make sure that that is sent to the correct agency because they're it's not even anything that the the business has is done it's all the employees earnings that they need to pay to the government so they're very strict on fines and penalties for that it's very hard to get to get those uh, refund any any penalties rebated or anything like that so I think that sort of brings us to a conclusion of what we wanted to talk about. So sort of questions that people might have. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you, Keith, but we've got a couple of questions that have come in, uh, which hopefully between the two of us we can answer. So the sort of first one pertains to is, 
when you fill out a W-4 and you maybe just say you claim zero, how, maybe explain, is it a certain uh, amount you hold? Are there tax tables? How, how is the withholding calculated? It, 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 I was going to say it's more along the lines of, because uh, in, in, definitely in the UK, it's, it's, a, it's sort of far easier. Our tax system in the UK is far easier. Uh, in, in the US, my understanding is that as you alter the withhold the the amount of exemptions and the dependencies, you look on a table, and depending on whether you're getting paid bi-weekly, monthly, uh, twice a month, you then just go to a table and pick out what you should be withholding. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit different than that. It tends to adjust a little bit more uh, up and down in the U.S., and it also can depend on what you actually make in an individual pay period. So if you're bonused or if you're, you get salaried once a month or if you get you know, uh, commission checks, it's always kind of going up and down to make a a variable rate. So, 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 so potentially, it really isn't looking at the cumulative taxes you paid. So, if in a sense you normally get paid a thousand a month, and all of a sudden you get fifty thousand in one month, you're more than likely to have far more tax withheld because that fifth, when you look at the table for that week or month of fifty thousand, it's assuming you're earning 50000 every other month, isn't it? Correct. That's exactly how it works. So if you make a big check at any point in the year, it assumes that you make that on your regular pay period, So, which is typically a two-week cycle. So in that situation, that would be a perfect... When we're talking about going back and filling out a w, new W-4, if you knew you were getting a big bonus and you didn't want to have to wait until you filed your tax return to get the refund, that's where you'd alter your W-4 for that one pay period to get less withheld so that it's smooth, it's deemed as if it's smoothed out over the whole year. Correct. It's, that's typically done on big bonuses at the end of the year or big commission checks for, for salespeople. That, that's when that typically happens. The money's not lost. If they do tax it and you don't adjust it, you will file. It'll come back to you on your return at the end of the year if they determine that you deserve, you should not have paid that much. Okay. Uh, also, a good question here, which I can take Keith talking about, is where you've maybe got an individual who is a dual resident or working in two countries and maybe on the payroll in two in two countries, is if as long as you're in a sense under the payroll and you're and also in this situation you'd be eligible to work. So we we've, we've met all the requirements to be able to work in the UK and the US. And the consequences in effect would be that you would look at the pay you earn in the US under the under the US entity and you would do your withholdings and all those requirements in the US. Then, in a sense, you'd look at your salary you were earning in the UK under the UK entity and do the correct amount there. And then the complications becomes is when you actually start filing your own personal return, where you have to true it up on both the returns. But yeah, but in, in effect, is if you're in the US working in the US and you're paying all your US taxes, in effect, with respect to those wages, the UK wouldn't be assessing the same payroll taxes on those wages. Uh, another another question that sort of just come in, and this is a, a, a sort of an, a, an interesting one, uh, is talking about. So what what happens, Keith? Because where you've got situations where you're an employer and your your facility or your manufacturing plant is on the border of another state. So, for example, say you're you've got a manufacturing plant in southern Ohio, or so, and and, oh, and it backs onto Pennsylvania, and your employees are living in Pennsylvania and they're resident in Pennsylvania, but they come to work every day in Ohio, how do you withhold PA taxes or do you withhold Ohio taxes at the state level? Typically, in the, st the states that I've worked with, um, the bordering states typically have an agreement that if they are living in Pennsylvania and working in Ohio as a border uh, situation, they withhold the state tax for the, s the state that they live in because that's really what the, the state tax is for. Now, on the flip side of that, if there's any sort of local tax, which is determined by where the um, work is actually being done, that would revert back to the Ohio tax laws. So, so what you're saying there is if you, so if you were in, uh, living in Pennsylvania, you come in, say you come and work in Youngstown, because Youngstown's got a local tax as well, mm -hmm. you would end up from a, your W-2, your pay slip would show Pennsylvania withholding taxes because you live in Pennsylvania, although you live, work in Ohio, and you would then have Youngstown city taxes taken out because so it's a city uh, Youngstown just says we don't care you're going back to Pennsylvania at night time. You're physically working here, so we want the taxes from you for working here. Correct. It's one of those situations. Where it's, it's it's very important to do some due diligence at the beginning of the situation when you're hiring an employee for something like that because it can also affect your workers' compensation, which states they want that to be 
uh, determine that your which which laws that you want to because they those vary very those vary a lot between the different states. Okay, and then uh, but then once again, so we're sort of saying this. But if if in and this is where there's a lot of states with reciprocity agreements because they know this issue is here. But if in a sense there was the situation where somebody was. Uh, sort of living in Ohio, but maybe going to uh, California every week to work. In that situation, I'm pretty sure that they would say uh, there's no reciprocity agreement because it's not convenient going across the state border. In that situation, you'd end up having California withholding taxes withheld, and then you'd have to then come back and pay potentially pay Ohio when you then filed your return at the end of the year. Correct. Sometimes they they'll give you some sort of credit or anything like that, but that that all determines. It's all determined by the individual states, so you would need to make sure that you take a peek at what that individual state requirements are for that, for both sides, the one you're working in and the one you live in. Okay. Just looking down the question, another question come in, uh, talking about uh, sort of liabilities, you, audits and stuff like that. What in Obviously, you're based in Ohio, Keith. We talked a little bit about audits, but are you what what audits are you seeing coming up the most? Do you see is the IRS coming in at the moment? Is the state income tax coming in? Who's who do we need to be more most worried about of potentially getting an audit from from what you're seeing in the field? In particular, in Ohio, the, the ones that I see the most of are, are workers' comp and unemployment. The reasons are those are the ones where false claims get. Uh, get filed and the unemployment rate is really high in Ohio. So I don't see too much of the federal government coming coming in doing audits, but that's actually one of the ones where they, if you're getting any trouble from the IRS, it's, it's typically because of a mispayment or a miscalculation or a late payment. As far as but the agencies that are looking for people for fraud are unemployment and workers' time. Okay, that sounds, that's good. Uh, I was going to say, I think we've got through all our questions. Uh, I was going to say we've got about five minutes left, so we can sort of wrap it up. If, for people here today that have been listening, if there were sort of uh, four or five key takeaways that you'd want to leave them with, what would those, what would those sort of four or five uh, key takeaways be that uh, if, they, if, if nobody heard anything else or been sleeping for the first 53 minutes, <laughs> what should they know? Uh, what's, what's, what are the most important things? I would say in the, these go in the in this is kind of in the order of how the payroll process works. The first key takeaway is determining whether you're an employee or a contractor. It's uh, number one priority that you have to do because it's going to determine how you set everything up moving forward. Um, which leads you into the, the the second point would be the employee onboarding, making sure that you have the state specific. Um, paperwork filled out, make sure you're making copies of it, giving yourself a file for your employee, giving the employee the same exact paperwork uh, in return. Make sure you have everything on record that they fill out, um, including the I-9, W-4, that type of thing. Um, figuring out, depending on where your business is located and where your employees are working, uh, the different payroll taxes for that individual area where you want to make sure that, because they, they vary from state, city, county, Anything in here, you want to make sure that you've got it all set up right away because that's how you avoid getting tax penalties, which is the last portion. Tax penalties and interest for non-compliance. It's important that you that you do the third step, determining what what you need to have filled out and what the compliance needs to be. Make sure that you're doing your calculations accurately based on that that information that you determined on that. Make sure that you're paying them on time and that your returns are all being filed. So, okay, well, Keith, that's fantastic. I think uh, the last 55 minutes is hopefully everybody who's been listening has picked up one or two things they didn't know before. Uh, thanks very much for coming in and spending the time with us uh, this morning, this afternoon, depending where you are. The one thing I would just like to say before before we go is uh, I, I still believe that payroll is, is the most uh, complex tax in the U.S., and I would definitely recommend that n nobody, when they're coming over here, tries to do their own payroll. They employ uh, a firm like Keith's firm or another payroll bureau to take care of it because there are, as you'll see from here, there's so many different registrations, so many different taxes. Uh, you might be paying tax that you don't actually have a facility in because your employees live in the next state. So those things are, are very important. So I, I can't uh, reiterate enough using a payroll company being, the, uh, being very, very important to uh, mitigate penalties and to make your life as smooth as possible. 
So I'd like to thank everybody for listening. The other thing I'd like to just mention is we will be having our next webinar in a couple of months' time, and it is going to be on the basics of sales tax in the U.S., which is, once again, a topic which we believe is substantially different than VAT in the U.K., and that I think is, is something that a lot of people have trouble getting together with the concept. So in a couple of months' time, we will be doing another webinar, and it will be on general concepts of sales tax. So I'd like to thank everybody for your time and listening, and uh, look forward to you joining us for our next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.